I'm Mike Eisenberg. Today is April 24th, 2017. So it's the 102nd anniversary of the beginning of the Armenian Genocide, the massacre of somewhere between half a million and one and a half million Armenians by the Turks during World War I. Uh, this past weekend was the American release of the movie The Promise, uh, which is, takes place against the background of the Armenian Genocide. Uh, it tells the story of three fictional characters, but sort of a composite of real-life people. Uh, an American reporter for the Associated Press, an Armenian medical student, and the, women that, the woman that they were both in love with, played by uh, Christian Bale, Oscar Isaac, and Charlotte Laban, respectively. It's an excellent movie. Go see it. Uh, but it does focus on sort of the trials and the tribulations of these three people. and doesn't tell a whole lot about the history uh, behind the Armenian Genocide. So I wanted to post something about that. And during the course of my research, I discovered this book here. Uh, Ambassador Morgenthau's story. So Henry Morgenthau Sr. was the American ambassador to Turkey at the beginning of World War I. And so he was there in the country and as this massacre was going on uh, they had American consulates all over all over Turkey and so he would get these reports by telegram of what was happening on an hourly Basis. So he was in this unique position to, to document what was going on and also to talk to the Turkish officials. And I'll say in a minute uh, what those conversations were like uh, when he confronted them about these horrible things that were happening. Uh, I, the way Ambassador Morgenthau told his story was more powerful than anything I could write, so I wanted to read to you a few excerpts uh, from his book. Um, he talks about how the first thing that the Turks did uh, was to disarm any Armenian soldiers who were in their own military and um, send them off to work camps, and eventually kill them. Uh, then they went around to all the civilians and collected any weapons that they had, and they would torture people uh, with these horrible tortures to uh, find out where the weapons were hidden, and, and Ambassador Morgenthau gives a very gruesome treatment of that. Um, I'm going to uh, read some pretty gruesome stuff, but that one was over the top. I'm not going to read that to you. I'm going to pick up where Ambassador Morgenthau confronts the, the very top level Turkish officials about these uh, atrocities. So he writes, One day I was discussing these proceedings with a responsible Turkish official who was describing the tortures inflicted. He made no secret of the fact that the government had instigated them, and like all Turks of the official classes, he enthusiastically approved this treatment of the detested race. This official told me that all these details were matters of nightly discussion at the headquarters of the Union and Progress Committee, which was the, the sort of governing body. Each new method of inflicting pain was hailed as a splendid discovery, and the regular attendants were constantly ransacking their brains in the effort to devise some new torment. He told me that they even delved into the records of the Spanish Inquisition and other historic institutions of torture and adopted all the suggestions found there. He did not tell me who carried off the prize in this gruesome competition, but common reputation throughout Armenia gave a preeminent infamy to Jevdet Bey, the Vali of Van, whose activities in that section I had already described. All through this country, all through the country, 
Jevdet was generally known as the horseshoer of Bashkale, for his connoisseur, for this connoisseur in torture had invented what was perhaps the masterpiece of all, that of nailing horseshoes to the feet of Armenian victims. Yet these happenings did not constitute what the newspapers of the time commonly referred to as the Armenian atrocities. They were merely the preparatory steps in the destruction of this race. The young Turks displayed greater ingenuity than their predecessor, Abdul Hamid. The injunction of the deposed sultan was merely to kill, kill, whereas the Turkish democracy hit upon an entirely new plan. Instead of massacring outright the Armenian race, they now decided to deport it. In the south and southeastern in the south and southeastern section of the Ottoman Empire lie the Syrian desert and the Mesopotamian Valley. Though part of this area was once the scene of a flourishing civilization, for the last five centuries it had suffered the blight that becomes the lot of any country that is subjected to Turkish rule. And it is now a dreary, desolate waste, without cities and towns or life of any kind, populated only by a few wild and fanatical Bedouin tribes. Only the most industrious labor expended through many years could transform this desert into an abiding place of any considerable population. The central government now announced its intention of gathering the two million or more Armenians living, uh, living in the several sections of the empire and transporting them to this desolate and uninhabitable region. Had they undertaken such a deportation in good faith, it would have represented the height of cruelty and injustice. As a matter of fact, the Turks never had the slightest idea of reestablishing the Armenians in this new country. They knew that the great majority would never reach their destination, and those who did would either die of thirst and starvation or be murdered by the wild Mohammedan desert tribes. The real purpose of the deportation was robbery and destruction. It really represented a new method of massacre. When the Turkish authorities gave the orders for these deportations, they were merely giving the death warrant to a whole race. They understood this well, and in their conversations with me, they made no particular attempt to conceal the fact. All through the spring and summer of 1915, the deport deportations took place. Of the larger cities, Constantinople and Smyrna and Aleppo were spared. Practically all other places where a single Armenian family lived now became the scenes of these unspeakable tragedies. Scarcely a single Armenian, whatever his education or wealth, or whatever the social class to which he belonged, was exempted from the order. In some villages, placards were posted ordering the whole Armenian population to present itself in a public place at an appointed time, usually a day or two ahead, and in other places the town crier would go through the streets delivering the order vocally. In still others, not the slightest warning was given. The gendarmes would appear before an Armenian house and order all the inmates to follow them. They would take women engaged in their domestic tasks without giving them the chance to change their clothes. The police fell upon them just as the eruption of Vesuvius fell on Pompeii. Women were taken from the wash tubs, children were snatched out of bed, the bread was left half-baked in the oven, the family meal was abandoned, partly eaten, the daily task, the children were taken from the schoolroom, leaving their books open at the daily task. And the men were forced to abandon their plows in the field and their cattle on the mountainside. 
Even women who had just given birth to children would be forced to leave their beds and join the panic-stricken throng, their sleeping babies in their arms. Such things as they hurriedly snatched up, a shawl, a blanket, perhaps a few scraps of food, were all that they could take of their household belongings. To their frantic questions, where are we going, the gendarmes would vouchsafe only one reply, to the interior. In some cases, the refugees were given a few hours, in exceptional instances a few days, to dispose of their property and household effects. But the proceeding, of course, amounted simply to robbery. They could sell only to Turks, and since both buyers and sellers knew that they had only a day or two to market the accumulations of a lifetime, the prices obtained represented a small fraction of their value. Sewing machines would bring one or two dollars, a cow would go for a dollar, a handful of furniture would be sold for a pittance. In many cases, Armenians were prohibited from selling or Turks from buying, even at these ridiculous prices, under pretense that the government intended to sell their effects to pay the creditors whom they would inevitably leave behind. Their household furniture would be placed in stores or heaped up in public places where it was usually pillaged by Turkish men and women. The government officials would also inform the Armenians that since their deportation was only temporary, the intention being to bring them back after the war was over, they would not be permitted to sell their houses. Scarcely had the former possessors left the village when Mohammedan Mohajirs, immigrants from other parts of Turkey, would be moved into the Armenian quarters. Similarly, all their valuables, monies, rings, watches and jewelry would be taken to the police stations for safekeeping, pending their return, and then parceled out among the Turks. Yet these robberies gave the refugees little anguish, for far more terrible and agonizing scenes were taking place under their eyes. The systematic extermination of the men continued. Such males as the persecutions which I have already described had left were now violently dealt with. Before the caravans were started, it became the regular practice to separate the young men from the families, tie them together in groups of four, lead them to the outskirts, and shoot them. Public hangings without trial, the only offense being that the victims were Armenians, were taking place constantly. The gendarmes showed a particular desire to annihilate the educated and the influential. From American consuls and missionaries, I was constantly receiving reports of such executions, and many of the events which they describe will never fade from my memory. At Angora, all Armenian men from 15 to 70 were arrested, bound together in groups of four, and sent on the road in the direction of Caesarea. When they had traveled five or six hours and had reached a secluded valley, a mob of Turkish peasants fell on them with clubs, hammers, axes, scythes, spades, and saws. Such instruments not only caused more agonizing deaths than guns and pistols, but as the Turks themselves boasted, they were more economical since they did not involve the waste of powder and shell. In this way, they exterminated the whole male population of Angora, including all its men of wealth and breeding, and their bodies, horribly mutilated, were left in the valley where they were devoured by wild beasts. After completing this destruction, the peasants and gendarmes gathered in the local tavern, comparing notes and boasting of the number of giaours that each had slain. In Trebizond, the men were placed in boats and set out into the Black Sea. Gendarmes would follow them in boats, shoot them down, and throw their bodies in the water. <laughs> 
When the signals were given for the caravans to move, therefore, they almost invariably consisted of women, children, and old men. Anyone who could possibly have protected them from the fate that awaited them had been destroyed. Not infrequently, the prefect of the city, as the mass started on its way, would wish them a derisive, pleasant journey. Before the caravan moved, the women were sometimes offered the alternative of becoming Mohammedans. Even though they accepted the new faith, which few of them did, because, you know, the, the Armenians were Christians, even though they accepted the new faith, their earthly troubles did not end. The converts were compelled to surrender their children to a so-called Muslim orphanage, with the agreement that they should be trained as devout followers of the Prophet. They themselves must then show the sincerity of their conversion by abandoning their Christian husbands and marrying Muslims. If no good Mohammedan offered himself as a husband, then the new convert was deported, however strongly she might protest her devotion to Islam. At first, the government showed some inclination to protect these departing throngs. The officers usually divided them into convoys, in some cases numbering several hundreds, in others several thousands. The civil authorities occasionally furnished ox carts which carried such household furniture as the exiles had succeeded in scrambling together. A guard of gendarmerie accompanied each convoy, ostensibly to guide and protect it. Women, scantily clad, carried, carrying babies in their arms or on their back, marched side by side with old men hobbling along with canes. Children would run along, evidently regarding the procedure in the early stages as some new lark. A more prosperous member might perhaps have a horse or a donkey, Occasionally, a farmer had rescued an assortment of family pets, a cow or sheep, uh, dogs, cats, birds. They, they became part of the variegated procession. From thousands of Armenian cities and villages, these de despairing caravans now set forth. They filled all the roads leading southward. Everywhere, as they moved, on they raised a huge dust and abandoned debris, chairs, blanket, bedclothes, household utensils, and other impedimenta marked the course of the processions. When the caravans first started, the individuals bore some resemblance to human beings. In a few hours, however, the dust of the road plastered their faces and clothes, the mud caked their lower members, and the slowly advancing mobs, frequently bent with fatigue and craved by the brutality of their protectors, resembled some new and strange animal species. Yet, for the better part of six months, from April to October 1915, practically all the highways of Asia Minor were crowded with these unearthly band of exiles. They could be seen winding in and out of every valley and climbing up the sides of nearly every mountain. Moving on and on, they scarcely knew whither, except that every road led to death. Village after village, and town after town were evacuated of its Armenian population under the distressing circumstances already described. In these six months, as far as can be ascertained, about 1,200,000 people started on this journey to the Syrian desert. Pray for us, they would say, as they left their homes the homes in which their ancestors had lived for 2,500 years. We shall not see you in this world again, but sometime we shall meet. Pray for us. The Armenians had hardly left their native villages when the persecutions began. The roads over which they traveled were little more than donkey paths, 
and what had started a few hours before as an orderly procession soon became a disheveled and scrambling mob. Women were separated from their children and husbands from their wives. The old people soon lost contact with their families and became exhausted and footsore. The Turkish drivers of the ox carts, after extorting the last coin from their charges, would suddenly dump them and their belongings into the road, turn around, and return to the village for other victims. Thus, in a short time, practically everybody, young and old, was compelled to travel on foot. The gendarmes whom the government had sent, supposedly to protect the exiles, in a very few hours became their tormentors. They followed their charges with fixed bayonets, prodding anyone who showed any tendency to slacken the pace. Those who attempted to stop for rest or who fell exhausted on the road were compelled with the utmost brutality to rejoin the moving throng. They even prodded pregnant women with bayonets. If one, as frequently happened, gave birth along the road, she was immediately forced to get up and rejoin the marchers. The whole course of the journey became a perpetual struggle with the Muslim inhabitants. Detachments of gendarmes would go ahead, notifying the Kurdish tribes that their victims were approaching. And Turkish peasants were also informed that their long-awaited opportunity had arrived. The government even opened the prisons and set free the convicts on the understanding that they should behave like good Muslims to the approaching Armenians. Thus, every caravan had a continuous battle for existence with several classes of enemies, their accompanying gendarmes, the Turkish peasants and villagers, the Kurdish tribes and bands of Shetes or brigands, and we must always keep in mind that the men who might have defended these wayfarers had nearly all been killed or forced into the army of workmen, and that the exiles themselves had been systematically deprived of all weapons before the journey began. When the victims had traveled a few hours from their starting place, the Kurds would sweep down from their mountain homes. Rushing up to the young girls, they would lift their veils and carry the pretty ones off to the hills. They would steal such children as please their fancy and mercilessly rob all the rest of the throng. If the exiles had started with any money or food, their assailants would appropriate it, thus leaving them a hopeless prey to starvation. They would steal their clothing and sometimes even leave both men and women in a state of complete nudity. All the time that these were committing, that they were committing these depredations, the Kurds would freely massacre and the screams of women and old men would add to the general horror. Such as escaped these attacks in the open would find new terrors awaiting them in the Muslim villages. Here the Turkish roughs would fall upon the women, leaving them sometimes dead from their experiences or sometimes ravingly insane. After spending a night in a hideous encampment of this kind, the exiles or such as who survived would start again the next morning. The ferocity of the gendarmes apparently increased as the journey lengthened for they seemed almost to resent the fact that part of their charges continued to live. Frequently, anyone who dropped on the road was bayoneted on the spot. The Armenians began to die by hundreds from hunger and thirst. Even when they came to rivers, the gendarmes, merely to torment them, would sometimes not let them drink. The hot sun of the desert burned their scantily clad bodies and their bare feet treading the hot sand of the desert became so sore that thousands fell and died or were killed where they lay. Thus, in a few days, what had been a procession of normal human beings became a stumbling horde of dust-covered skeletons, ravenously looking for scraps of food eating any offal that came their way, crazed by the hideous sights that filled every hour of their existence. <laughs>
sick with all the diseases that accompany such hardship and privations, but still prodded on and on by the whips and the clubs of their executioners. Morgenthau concludes the episode by saying, my only reason for relating such dreadful things is this. Without the details, the English-speaking public cannot understand precisely what this nation is, which we call Turkey. I have by no means told the most terrible details. For a complete narration of the sadistic orgies of which these Armenian men and women were the victims can never be printed in an, Amer in an American publication. Whatever crimes the most perverted instincts of the human mind can devise, and whatever refinements of persecution and injustice the most debased imagination can conceive, became the daily misfortunes of this devoted people. I am confident that the whole history of the human race contains no such horrible episode as this. The great massacres and persecutions of the past seem almost insignificant compared with the sufferings of the Armenian race in 1915. A horrible story, but it's important that we remember it. See the promise. Uh, Ambassador Morgenthau told the story of the Armenian genocide to the world. First through his contacts in the media, there were something like 150 articles in the New York Times while it was going on. And then later through his book, which came out in 1918. Of course, despite this, the Nazi Holocaust, which we also remember today, happened anyway some 30 years later. But maybe if we tell the story again, and we keep telling the story, and we keep telling it, and we try to understand it, and we try to understand the ideologies that were behind it, Maybe someday we can prevent such things from ever happening again.